Mr. Baryam, uh, welcome back. Uh, please state your name and affiliation again for the record, and then you may proceed with your 10 minutes. Thank you. I'm Yanir Baryam, professor and founding president of the New England Complex Systems Institute. I work on mathematical analyses to identify the variables necessary and sufficient to describe a complex problem at large scale. This enables determining how to control and intervene in critical social problems, including hunger, poverty, violence, market crashes, economic growth, and pandemics. I have worked on pandemics for 16 years, advising the UN, CDC, WHO, National Security Council, including on Ebola outbreaks in Africa. I am a co-founder of the World Health Network, which is devoted to promoting health globally. Science, not surprisingly, is about what we see and learn about the world around us. It is about life itself. All of us have formative experiences in life. For me, one of them was the loss of my sister, Orit, who was two years older than me. She cared deeply about helping people. For years afterward, I drove her car. On the steering wheel, there was attached the serenity prayer that many of you surely know. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. In science, as in life, the most important question is, can we make it better? This is what I study as a complexity scientist. Today, I want to tell you that the pandemic has been mischaracterized as something that we can't control, even can't do anything about. The challenge indeed is not so much what to do, but to recognize that we can. Here today, we have historic opportunity to change the direction of society from failure, causing illness, death, and disability on a spiral of devastation to a new path that will lead to an exit from this catastrophic condition. The place to start is in the workplace and to provide a precedent for positive action in our communities. Business needs guidelines that will enable safety for workers, customers, and the product supply chain, leading to improved economic function. Economy depends on health. Infection followed by infection, disability accumulating from long COVID organ damage after multiple infections is untenable. Why do I say we can do something when there is so much defeatism as well as wishful thinking that ending the pandemic will happen just by itself? Let's start by addressing the mistaken belief that we can't do anything. There are five pillars of prevention, masking, ventilation, testing, social distancing, and vaccination. Each of these has multiple levels, from poor to outstanding. First, masks. From cloth and surgical masks that might have been somewhat effective early in the pandemic, to N95s that help now, to elastomeric respirators that would stop almost all infection, to PAPRs that could stop infection entirely. Second, ventilation and HEPA purification, according to conventional standards, help significantly. Elevating standards makes it even better, and the risks can be minimal in many locations if we place HEPA purifiers near workers or customers based upon measured airflows, an example we just heard about recently. Third, testing is the most widely accepted measure. Reactive symptomatic and exposure testing has a significant effect. Proactive, frequent screening, which in workplaces can and is being done once daily at some locations, including fire departments, at $1 per test using lab testing, can cause transmission to decrease even for Omicron and can make risk minimal if it is done twice. Saliva tests are fine. Fourth, social distancing ranges from avoiding gatherings all the way to lockdowns. Fifth, Vaccination in conjunction with other measures could have stopped the pandemic, but over-reliance on vaccination alone undermined its utility because of new variants that would not have arisen if we effectively used other measures to reduce transmission. What is important is that a combination of these five can be crafted based upon receptiveness and technology adoption, and there are many choices that all work. Note that even though treatments exist, variants are undermining them, they are not adequately available or equitably distributed, they do not always work and have significant side effects, and as far as we know, the only way to stop long COVID disability is to stop infection. The workplace is the place to start. It is in the advantage of employers, despite short-sightedness, there should be complete agreement and imperative to protect workers, customers, and product pipelines.
And yet, direct protection is essential, but not enough to protect healthcare workers. We need to reduce demand in the form of community transmission causing disease. Healthcare workplace protection would not solve the downward spiral of staffing inadequacy and burnout and delayed and degraded standards of care. The way to solve the problem is to protect everyone from transmission. All workers must be protected to protect healthcare workers. We need comprehensive protection. Regulation exists in the complexity of multidisciplinary knowledge. Each discipline has its own assumptions. Medical and biological sciences are different from social and engineering knowledge. Biologists may focus on vaccines, but high mass quality is no less a game changer. And lamp testing is now easy to do, costs $1 per test, and can be scaled to hundreds of millions per week immediately. Naysayers distort science, technology, and economics. It is important to remember that scientists in general are passive observers. Biologists see biological phenomena, not socio-technical advances or collective action, and surely not the opportunities of global enterprise engaging in coordinated effort. To know what can be done, use a startup mentality and galvanize multidisciplinary teams to meet the challenge, as my colleague Kevin Hedges recently emphasized. In this light, passivity makes no sense. We have advanced since 1918. We have better science, technology, and communication to coordinate action. We provided people with clean water. We can provide clean air. Just as the virus can mutate and gain an advantage, we can innovate to defeat it. Our economic freedom-driven culture has a knee-jerk reaction, a desire for freedom from regulations. There are those who may say to themselves, I didn't have those expenses before, I shouldn't have them now. We must recognize that there is a pandemic. The true costs of the pandemic are manifest in both acute illness and in post-acute effects, including cardiovascular events, symptoms of long COVID and its organ damage and disability. Brain fog will cost workers and employers. We will surely pay for short-sighted views that focus on comparatively minuscule costs of masking, ventilation, testing, sick leave and support, and other precautions. Essential costs must be identified and incorporated into business expectations, as well as payments and reimbursements, and where appropriate government support. The real costs are from the disease, and this will get worse unless we act. I know a bit about unintended consequences, but it doesn't take a complexity scientist to know that prevention is the low cost way. Unfortunately, we can't use CDC guidelines because they are simply not correct. Occupational health is part of public health, but CDC is not engaged now in public health. Finally, the often unrecognized part of the pandemic action is action when danger is low. Pandemics should not be thought of as waves, but as a fire. We know the solution is to put them out. Similarly for pandemics, getting things to be a bit better is not enough. Can we do it? Multiple times we have achieved cases going down. When cases go down, focus and put the fire out. We have been suffering from the pandemic for two years, complaining about its effect on the economy. Should we suffer for another two or more? Should we sacrifice lives pretending it is inevitable or doesn't exist? The data shows strong action can reduce cases dramatically in four to six weeks. Then we only need to prevent a new wave so the fire is not rekindled. We just need to start. We have the know-how, we need the will. I hope you will recognize not just the challenge, but the opportunity to make a difference. Seize this opportunity. Thank you. I think you are muted. Thank you, sir. Does OSHA have questions of this witness? Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, one question from OSHA. You mentioned in your testimony five different control strategies, and you noted that there are many choices and all work. Um, so for an OSHA standard where we have to be specific about how employers should implement those strategies, or at least provide some direction to employers so that they might choose in a way that we can measure um, in enforcement and inspections, how would you suggest we take the menu of options that you've laid out and the suggestion that there's different ways to combine them and write that into an enforceable standard? 
I, I, we have been thinking about this and the best answer is to identify several different levels of each of these precautions and then to identify viable choices that combine among those levels. So if there are three levels in each of them, then one could identify how to uh, choose a set of them that would give some flexibility to a particular enterprise or a particular context. And, and some of them are more appropriate to some context than to others, that's clear. Uh, and, and in general, for office workers, uh, as for you know, uh, consumer-facing businesses, you would use different combinations. But there is a way to specify in terms of level of risk reduction, tenfold, a hundredfold, or a thousandfold, what each of these measures can provide and to recommend combinations of them as choices to be adopted. Thank you for that response, Mr. Baryam. I would recommend and suggest that if you do have additional specifics about how you would implement the, that approach of having different levels of precautions for different scenarios, um, most particularly in the healthcare setting, um, we would appreciate those thoughts um, in the post-hearing comment period. Thank you. That, that concludes the questions from OSHA, Your Honor. Thank you. Will the contractor promote Kevin Hedges? Mr. Hedges, do you have a question for this witness? Yeah. Hi, Yanir. So my question has to do is, you know, we need to understand what went wrong to move forward. And um, so it's kind of a general question. It's, uh, it's around the World Health Organization. And, and just what is your understanding about, um, you know, if you think about China invoking airborne precautions in 2020 after the start of the pandemic, and then, you know, think about the World Health Organization, what's your understanding about uh, the World Health Organization's use of multidisciplinary expertise in setting direction globally to manage the pandemic? Unfortunately, um, the challenge has not been met by multidisciplinary teams. And as one example, um, the WHO has been declaring what the economic consequences of actions are, even though the economists at IMF, for example, say exactly the opposite. Uh, so uh, for some reason, the public health uh, professionals who have studied medicine are, are, are declaring economic consequences and ignoring the economists. Um, and this is an example that the airborne precaution is another one where uh, engineers and those who understand airborne processes um, were marginalized relative to a traditional um, medical concept that doesn't apply in this context. So we are we are uh, constantly faced by a push me pull you uh, of, 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 of thinking that uh, somehow is unable to galvanize the tremendous talents that we have globally uh, in all disciplines uh, to bring our efforts together uh, to achieve the outcome that is a challenge for all of our society. Um, we should not be faced with a situation that WHO does, which is to say, well, we have to do things very quickly, uh, but don't do this, this, or this. Uh, each of the things are playing a role. Each of the actions that we can take plays a role. If we do them well and in the right combination and at the right times, um, we know that we can accomplish a lot. But in order to do so, we have to use the tremendous knowledge that we actually have uh, to accomplish the outcomes that we desire. Thank you. Will the contractor please promote Theo Allen? Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Baryam, I know we've had many discussions on this, but I do have a question about how can OSHA use this complexity science under a framework where they have to decide 
what's a significant risk, what's disproportionately not in the scope of daily life, and what precautions for which industries should be implemented if you give them a large list and they need to narrow it down to a set of enforceable standards. Thank you, Theo. Um, the key thing is that complexity science, there is a paper that I could submit if you'd like, it's called Why Complexity is Different. What the complexity science analysis can do is to identify what are the relevant variables, the things that actually matter. Because if you think about the complexity of the world, we are constantly faced with this challenge of too much information. And by identifying what really matters, it focuses our attention on how to achieve the objectives that we want. And it's like knowing to drive a car. If you know that the steering wheel, the gas and the brakes and the transmission are the things that you really need to know about, you won't start doing things that don't matter when you're driving, like opening and closing the back door. Um, so we really have to be able to focus our attention and, and to understand what's happening. We know what the control variables are for this disease. If we focus on that and ask what are the things that will impact that the most, then we will be able to overcome these challenges. So that's what complexity science can offer in this context, the avoidance of distraction. Um, and again, a lot of the disinformation and misinformation out there is like magic trick. All they do is point to the wrong thing to pay attention to. It's, they don't even have to say things that are incorrect in order to distract us from doing what we really need to do. So focused attention on the most important variables, identifying the things that will affect those variables and, and making sure that we execute on that imperative. Thank you, Theo. Thank you. Are there additional questions for this witness in the chat or star three? There are no other hands raised at this time. Mr. Barion, thank you again for your testimony this afternoon. Thank you, Your Honor.